the one thing I did not want to do was reinvent the Spider-Man costume. I didn't want to create for the kids a new look that was our look of Spider-Man. Instead, I felt that my job was more of a translation process, working with Jim Atchison. What we wanted to do was bring the Spider-Man that the kids and the adults know to the big screen. I looked at every comic. I looked extensively at all the illustrators of Spider-Man. I wanted to be very faithful to the fans, if you like. The Amazing Spider-Man! My name's the Human Spider. I don't care. Get out there. No, he got my name wrong. Get, Get out, out there, there, you moron. We had talked about different things, and the idea was Peter put this costume together out of what he had lying around or what he could easily get his hands on and just, you know, did a drawing on a sweatshirt and threw on some sweatpants that were the right colors and these shoes and then wore those, like, motorcycle gloves and this hood thing that you see his eyes. In the real world movie of Spider-Man, which we tried to make it, it was important to have real good justification where this crazy outfit came from. These wrestling acts have the most outrageous outfits. And so he designed his own outrageous outfit, hence the Spider-Man costume. We tested for four months various treatments of the costume. Alex, take a step toward Chris. That was quite a process. <laughs> First, I had to do a full body cast, and then I also had to do the head cast. We needed Spider-Man to be a very lithe and agile character, yet we needed to make him look like he had uh, the muscles that a superhero would have. And the two were in great conflict with one another. So Jim came up with a lot of great technologies working on the costume. One of the ideas we had was to try and make the, the web itself just slightly three-dimensional, so that the suit would have the, would have the texture of the web. And that proved to be a really difficult thing to achieve. I was very impressed with what they finally did with it. I think the thing that really stepped it up a notch for me is we were trying on all these different suits, and you know it has the webbing in it. And I tried suits on that the webbing was sort of part of the pattern, and then I tried a suit on where the webbing was three-dimensional. There are separate pieces like on top of the suit. That's what sort of put it over the top because it added dimension to the suit. Spidey's got to adjust his glasses. What we've done with the, with the outfit is to overprint about 130 different silk screen prints. The silk screening process embeds the color through the fiber so that when you stretch the fabric, it stays saturated with color. There were 147 screens for all the different parts and colors and pieces. The idea is that the shading that you see on the Spider-Man costume okay. relates to the sort of muscle groups on the body and that they move with the body. So although the suit is two-dimensional, we get a slight optical sense of three-dimensional. The company Oak Leaf Sunglasses made, uh, we got to where we got our lenses, and the frames and everything else were all taken from hand-sculpted bits that uh, our sculptor, Ray Scott, had uh, created over a year's time. These uh, eyepieces are originally sculpted by hand and then they poured a mold and the frames are made from hard composite plastic. It was a real challenge to make the Spider-Man costume, to make it look alive and, and beautiful on film. We put the picture out on the internet and got this just tremendous response, amazing response. So that was, was very gratifying. In my eyes, there's a lot more room to go wrong with the Green Goblin's costume. You're an amazing creature, Spider-Man. You and I are not so different. I'm not like you. You're a murderer. Well, to each his own. So again, we went back to the comic, and there's this rather strange concept of a man in a rubber mask and a rubber suit and a purple vest and purple boots flying along on a little kind of glider. I mean, when you hear Goblin, you see Halloween, you see latex, you see, 
you see the books, and the books were sort of, uh, you know, the goblin was pretty cheesy uh, throughout history. Before I arrived, the art department had done some quite extensive artwork about making the, the glider and the Green Goblin a much more high-tech idea. I think in some ways the Green Goblin was more challenging to somehow have it reference and relate to Norman Osborn and what he's doing. So because he's a scientist and he's developed the glider and maybe the suit had to be a little more high-tech so that it had some relationship to the glider. We felt that the Goblin's outfit could have been designed as a, a weapon of war, a battle suit, so we could justify the green justify the armor plating and like ancient weapons of war we felt that it may have a mask something frightening to strike terror into the hearts of uh, the enemy i thought that the thing we had to retain about the green goblin was that kind of screaming face and it seemed to me important that whatever we did with the rest of the outfit we had to somehow retain this maniacal scream it's like a project for nasa there was so much research and development on the suit, it was crazy. I must have done 40, 50 hours of fittings in the suit, them just trying different things. So they had to play around with certain ideas of materials and how the suit would work. Jim tested many different fabrics. We tried leather, we tried all sorts of different fabrics, and they would look great here, and they look on camera, they just look dead. And this was the only one that seemed to have a sort of reptilian look that he wanted. We have an actor who's probably the most athletic and, and physically agile person that I've ever worked with in Willem Dafoe, and therefore we adapted and changed the costume to make sure that he is able to be as mobile as possible. The suit was a pain in the ass. It was really uncomfortable to wear. It was so tight and so heavy that after a whole day in that thing, you felt like you had just gone 12 rounds. In the end, I think the suit works quite well, but it's a long, long process. It's not like he just draws this thing up and then says, go make it. In the end, the journey we went was that we went out doing our own thing and being, you know, innovative. But we kept coming back to the actual drawings of Spider-Man, is that in order to maintain the integrity of Spider-Man, we had to be faithful to it.